A very good evening and a very warm welcome to today's Lagadum lecture. My name is Vanita Yadav. I am a Fulbright visiting scholar at the Lagadum Center at MIT. It's indeed my proud privilege to introduce to you Shanaz Hussain, India's beauty ambassador, global face of woman power. How do you capture the essence of a woman who's been painted by M.F. Hussain? Honored by Indian President Kalam with Padma Shri, interviewed by Goldie Horn, being a confidant to India's most charismatic woman prime minister, presented the international award in Paris, walked the red carpet at Cannes, rubbed shoulders with world celebrities, including Princess Diana. Launched by Barbara Cartland at the Galleries Le Fay in Paris, and Harrods in London, honored for outstanding innovation at House of Commons British Parliament, honored by Princess Grace at the Monte Carlo, celebrated by Deepak Chopra, awarded World Medal of Freedom at the Annual World Forum, Washington DC, lectured at Harvard and Oxford, honored by Hillary Clinton and invited to MIT offered the role of Empress Noor Jahan by a Hollywood film directed and Woman of Substance, a film on her amazing life by Beverly Hills Film Production, selected as the United Nations Woman of the Decade. Elected Chairman of CIDESCO, World Beauty Congress, New York, received Woman of the Millennium Award from Global Indian Congress, USA, recognized by President Obama, awarded the world's greatest entrepreneur by US-based Success Magazine as the first woman in 109 years selected Forbes Woman of the Year, received Woman of the Year Award from the Governor of California, USA, and made not just an entire nation, but people across the globe wake up to India's Vedic system of medicine. I'm absolutely honored and overwhelmed. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker today, Ms. Shanaz Hussain. Ma'am, please come. I think after hearing everything that Vanita has to say, I have very little to add. But, uh, my presence here at MIT today is really to speak on entrepreneurship and how I created a brand without publicity. I lectured in Harvard on the same subject. When I asked Professor Hayes why I'm invited to Harvard, because I've not been to business school, he said that we teach our students at Harvard that every time you launch a brand, you have to put that much money advertising or publicity, you violate every norm we teach at business school. I would say the same thing at MIT that what I have really proved is that publicity is not required. Word of mouth finally does the job. What I really did was something very different as an entrepreneur. As engaged at 14, at 15 I was married at 16, my daughter was one year old. It was tough because I was not educated enough to stand on my own feet. I was a housewife with a baby, lots of intelligence, but no education. My husband was posted to Tehran, and I thought, okay, I must educate myself. So I went to a school. I said, can I teach and earn money to educate myself? because there was a limit of foreign exchange. The government of India paid $50 per person to go abroad. That was about 30 years ago. Now it's, of course, no limits. And uh, they said, uh, we can't give you the job. And I was very good in English. I was into Shakespeare and Keats when I went for the job to teach English in Tehran. And uh, they said that uh, we can't give you the job because you're not a graduate. Now that hit me very hard because I said, my God, I can't get a job to teach ABC because I'm not a graduate. So then I went home and I was very quiet and at a party I met an English lady who said I'll give you a job 
to write beauty articles. And what I want to come to fast as an entrepreneur is that the little incidents I just told uh, Agnes, which understands the brain of an entrepreneur. You know, I had made up my mind very early that, you know, this is too bad just sitting home doing nothing. There's no way that I would do nothing. I have to do something. And something wasn't possible because I wasn't educated. I was married with a baby and no education. The type that required uh, some kind of uh, remuneration. So I met this lady to party and she said, you speak very good English. I said, yes, it's Tehran. And she said, would you write like, beauty articles? I said, yes. I sent her some articles and she said, you got the job. I was writing uh, constantly and earning very good money. I needed money to educate myself. And I got a letter one day saying that, dear princess, either stop writing or start typing because your writing is illegible. So I said, my God, I've lost my job. And uh, so I started typing. I was giving her about 10,000 words a week. And because I was not trained, I was typing with one finger. And the finger became, I just told Agnes, became so sore that uh, I used to, you know, it was a bleed, so I used to wrap it up with a Band-Aid and then go on typing. And the typewriter was full of just little marks of blood all the time because it bled and I went on typing. If I stopped typing, I'd have to stop paying my fees because I needed the money to pay my education abroad. I was very clever. I thought I have to go through eight schools all over the world. So first I deposit my fees and then I'll go to school because that kind of money wasn't available in India. And uh, I had to go on typing. So then finally when my fingers became very sore and hurt, I went to a doctor. And he said that, look here, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I type to uh, collect money for my beauty schools. And he said that, uh, well, if you don't stop typing, you know, the flesh was really bad, the finger that I typed with, about 10,000 words a week. He said, if you don't stop typing, I'll have to cut off your fingers. I'll never forget. I gave him one look and I looked down and said that my fingers are so long. Even if it cuts off a little bit, there'll be such a long bit left. <laughs> so that's what you call entrepreneurship. And I'll never forget, but that was the moment in my life that I thought that now just do or die. I wasn't prepared to go back. I had to go ahead and had the, my back to the wall. And he said, what? The Russian doctor, he said, you're mad. And he rang up the ambassador. He said, there's a princess who came from India and she's really crazy. She says how much you cut off and her fingers in bad shape. She can't type anymore. And believe it or not, in short, I continued for three years. I went on typing with the bandage and the band-aid. I earned enough money to pay for eight schools in nine countries and came back to India in six years as, and went to the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, my name went up as the highest qualified cosmetician in the world at my age because I started at 14. So that was the limit of entrepreneurship that I really put in. And I think that any entrepreneur must realize, if you make up your mind, you do what you do, there's no looking back. I thought that now what am I going to do? Where do I start? So I started innovating in Ayurveda, plants. And that is where the story of Shana's plant path started. It's very difficult for me to describe the journey I went through. That will take a long time. I'll open myself to questions. But I would like to say that if you want to do something with your life, if you want to make up your mind to do something, it has to be something that will never, never give up. An entrepreneur fights the back to the wall. If you want to do something, there is no stopping. It's up to you to make up your mind. Hi, I'm Bijal. Um, I'm an MBA, um, and I graduate um, this coming June. And I currently have a startup that focuses on taking old saris and turning them into new products. And I'm Caroline. I'm a first year urban planning student and an entrepreneur in solar energy and waste recycling in India. Um, so we have prepared some questions to ask you. Um, and then we'll leave a little bit of time at the end so that the audience can also ask questions. But the first question I'm dying to ask you is how did you come up with this idea? And what was your first year of business like? I'll be there. Yeah. Oh. I was uh, studying in a school in London, and uh, at Rubenstein, 
and the girl used to come every morning with a very beautiful lady and make her sit in the chair outside and come inside. And I said, why do you make her sit outside, bring the lady inside? And she said, she's my mother. I said, fine, bring her in. And said, uh, no, my mother is blind. I said, what happened? She said she was a model for a very famous makeup company and uh, she used to model mascara and eyeliner. Over a period, she lost her eyes. She's gone blind. And I started thinking, she was my best friend. I said, if a woman can go blind with the use of an eyeliner, then there's trouble for the future. So why don't we create something that is problem free? And the only thing that I thought problem free is plants and nature, because I don't think honey or yogurt or sandalwood or neem or any other tree could hurt or harm, but chemicals can. So that is where the story of Ayurveda started in my mind. I saw the Western world staggering under the side effects of chemicals, going back to nature, and back to nature made back to plant power and India and Ayurveda. And how was your first year of business? What happened in the first year? The very, very unusual, you know, I think that I was different from everybody else. I was sort of destiny's child. I think there's nothing very great about me. I think I was the right place at the right time in history. When the world was looking, I was just there and ready to take off. Uh, I started just one salon in the house. And because I did not have enough money to invest in my business, I thought it'll take uh, a place in the part of the house I'd use less and open it into a salon. So when my husband or children needed me, I was there, otherwise I was in the business. And I was paying no rent because I was in the house. So I was a mother and a housewife and a career woman and everything together. And uh, I thought that, you know, I, I, this, what would make me very different is that I thought that if I advertise and say that I'm the best, come and try my skin treatments. Uh, I would be talking about myself. So immediately people would come, but then it's up to them to decide. So I would not advertise at all. I would uh, um, let them speak for themselves when they were cured. And what I did do different was I did, wasn't to beauty. I was in treatments and with uh, plants and herbs uh, and skin cure and skin care, not beauty. It was different from everybody else. So that is where the story started and then People started dropping in, having treatments, and talking about it. So, a period of time, the word spread that there's such a woman, you know, staying in this area that works uh, miracles with the skin, plants. And then, I, one of my clients went to Italy, and one of the doctors said, "Go back to the country of Shanaz, and she has a cure." So, I understood that Italy also has arrived by way of knowledge. So, gradually, the word spread, and I think it took almost—it uh, wouldn't. Uh, make you amused, but it took for 30 years to be 